Okay. Are you okay. all? I would like to thank you for having the time to be here and participate in this important, important discussion. Uh, the need of having other uh, entities in this space is the, the main reason for this discussion. And until now, we have spoken about uh, the motivation and we saw and we saw uh, uh, two two possible approaches to to reach a solution, and we started exploring one of them, the this space crease. This space crease was started in, initially by Chineke, and it's now supported by Four Science. Andrea Bellini is one of the leaders in this project, and he showed us on our last meeting some of the guts of this space crease. Today, this session is ded dedicated to explore this space crease and uh, to put our hands on this space crease. So I will hand over to Andrea for him to, to take this lead and to show us uh, this space crease in action. Uh, just uh, one note, uh, I have I, I tried to, to create a virtual box, virtual image to, to share with you, but um, currently stuck in, in the upload process. It, it is uh, two, 20 gigabytes, but um, probably the, the process we will end during this session. I, I will post a, a link to, for you to download the, the image and you can install in your local system, okay? So I will hand over to, to Andrea. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Paul. So to, today's session is to give a first introduction, technical introduction to the space, Chris. We have a couple of exercises. Uh, I think that the first thing that we need to, uh, to do is to look to the this space Chris uh, documentation website that is uh, on uh, the this space this space uh, wiki. So on the Dura Space Wiki, we have a um, space that is reserved to this space Chris, where you have uh, uh, both the functional documentation under the project documentation section, where you can find the webinar recording and the slide presented over this year uh, by by me and the other member of the Space Chris community, and you have the technical documentation. <clears throat> Sorry. The technical documentation is quite extended, uh, is around uh, 150 page as PDF. Uh, you have uh, uh, motivation for the use of this space Chris into the introduction, and you have the installation and upgrade uh, procedure and more detail about uh, how to customize your Dispace Chris installation. So, the first exercise for today was intent to migrate an existing Dispace installation uh, into a Dispace Chris. Uh, we can open, I just created a, a new server on Amazon for this session. Here I have uh, um, an installation of uh, the space five that is essentially uh, the, um, the demo website of uh, the space. So the content is from the, the demo of uh, the official demo from the space of the space. And uh, it is uh, um, the space 5.2 version. So we can um, just check So I have created all the content for this DSpace 5 installation. Inside data and DSpace 5, we have the Tomcat the installation and the source code. So we can just go in Tomcat and uh, start up the server container. So, sorry, Andrea. It is possible to migrate an older version or you need to migrate it to 
the same the space Chris version. For instance, uh, you if, can migrate if, any version. Any version. Any version can be migrated to the space Chris. Essentially, I have uh, uh, set up the migration for the most complex task. So I need to see the, the address of the server. For for instance, you could could have the uh, the space Chris version three. And uh, sorry, the space version three and migrate to the space space Chris version five. Yes. Okay. So if you go on the installation documentation, you can migrate uh, any version of uh, the space or the space Chris to a new version of the space Chris. Mm, the, um, the update process essentially is uh, the same update process that you have with the space. If you migrate from the space 1.6 to the space 6, you need to go, um, you can use Flyway and your database is migrated automatically. You need to update code and run Maven package and then update. Uh, this is mostly the, uh, the process. And if you want to go from a space uh, one six to the space Chris six, you can do that exactly in the same way. The only uh, the difficult part is when you migrate uh, a space installation that have a long history. So maybe you have something that was started with uh, the space uh, one six, and after a while is migrated to the space three, the space four, the space five, and now you want to migrate to the space Chris six. If you look to the documentation, essentially this is uh, um, this step where you have three alternatives that depend on uh, uh, which version you are migrating and uh, if you have uh, um, already done some migration in your uh, uh, installation. So if you migrate from a very old version to the space Chris, it is very easy. If you migrate from a um, recent version of the space to uh, the space Chris also is easy. The most tricky part is when you have something that was migrated several times. That is exactly what I'm trying to reproduce here. So currently this is the, the demo website and it is a 5.4 uh, version. But if we look to the history, so if we connect to the database, and this place five, and you look to the schema version uh, table where Flyway stored information, you see that this was initialized as a version four. So this repository started with uh, the space four, zero, and after a while it was migrated to the space 5.4. So this is the most complex situation to migrate to the space, Chris. Um, Bolini, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for some information. I did those steps because uh, we have migrated three databases uh, and we have encountered um, a problem that prevented the database migration. I, I think I, re I sent you a database to, to try uh, with one of our uh, instances. Uh, what happened, I, uh, I had to run uh, uh, SQL queries by hand because um, the, the update didn't occur. Um, I think uh, maybe that's the case because we come from an old version of this space. I don't remember, 1.8? Yeah, 1.8. But uh, w that was one of the issues migrating the database. Uh, the first issue we, we, had, we had was important from IPs because uh, IPs um, have a lot of problems, memory problems and other configurations. 
Okay, this is documented. So we just need to follow up the documentation and you will see that the migration is uh, quite easy. So probably there are some tricky data because when you have real space instance, you can have also mess data in your database. You, everything can go wrong. But in, um, in a typical situation, you, if you follow the, the migration guide, you will be able to migrate. So the steps are, we are migrating. So we need to download the uh, source code of this space Chris that we want to use. And uh, <clears throat> I will do that. Uh, I prepared the commands. I will clone the source code from GitHub and uh, we will take the seed uh, version of this space Chris and store the new source code in the subfolder source update. This should take no long. Okay, so I will go to stop Tomcat. If you are doing a real migration, of course, you need to back up your database and uh, your content to be sure to, to be able to restore if something go wrong. You need to edit uh, some essential uh, configuration of the space Chris. So, <clears throat> um, I want to, to see, be sure to stay in the same uh, situation that I have uh, uh, checked uh, yesterday. So, this is the, the shy one that I uh, <clears throat> tested uh, yesterday because I, I'm using a, a branch where we are currently mm, doing some additional development, development. And now we go to uh, configure uh, our installation. So it is a display six. So we need to copy the local CFG file example and create our local CFG. And now we can edit our configuration file. So the minimal amount of uh, uh, configuration parameters to change is the, the space installation directory. So in our case, is uh, uh, data the space file install. And uh, we will use the EP address. And uh, I don't want to have JSPY in the URL, so I will strip the uh, the space UI on the, the space URL. We can customize the name so to be sure to see the new version. And we need to check the database configuration. So we want to use the, the space five uh, database and it's based on uh, this space five as a username for um, for the Postgres. Okay, so this is really the only thing that 
you need to, to change immediately. Uh, now you need to build the installer. So you can just find um, package. It will take around two or three minutes. So I, if you have any question, it could be good time to ask. Any question up to now? Can someone confirm that he's still here? Yep. Yeah, you're still here, Andrea. Um, I don't have any questions. Okay, it sounds like everything is pretty straightforward. And, and from my understanding, this basically just uses the same upgrade process as DSpace normally uses, like you mentioned, in terms of automatically upgrading the data. And then it's a matter of bringing over code or user interface changes after that, correct? Yes, exactly. So the, the only minimal issue arises when uh, um, we need to upgrade from something that I have already executed the flyway migration, uh, but I have skipped all the migration from this space, Chris. Because uh, if you have already run uh, Flyway as in, uh, in our uh, in this example, you have uh, uh, in the history, in the schema version, um, the, the entry point for 4.0 and 5.0, but you have skipped uh, 4.1 of this space, Chris, 4.2 uh, and so on. And this will require to uh, execute some SQL script uh, manually and uh, uh, repair the database during the migration. This is what is documented here. So now we are creating the, the installer, but when we go to uh, complete the migration, we will need to check the state of the database. And we will hit this situation where we will uh, have some pre-init state. I see something in the chat. Okay. Uh, the pre-init state for some script, and specifically, it will be uh, tricky to deal with the uh, uh, SQL script related to the space case. So uh, okay. we will need to fix this situation. But we will see soon that it is a, a new virtual machine. In Amazon, so it need to download a lot of things. But we are already compiling, so it should be at the end of the process. Now.
Andre, you already had the the jars in your system, right? Yesterday, I tried to to download the to install the, the this space cruise, and I th <laughs> I was I was thinking that the, um, this space was saving all the internet in my system. Uh, yes, but this is the, the usual way also then when you compile this space, because yes. Maven downloads a lot of dependency. Uh, we will save some time now because we have already compiled uh, this space yes. on that. So we only need to have the additional dependency from uh, on this space. So this is why it will, will require just a couple of minutes instead than to empty probably that will be the time for the first build and ju just a note i I've, uh, make uh, uh, available the the link for the compressed uh, uh, virtual image to use in virtual box if uh, anyone has interest in using it i posted the um, the link in the the zoom group chat Okay, thank you. It would be uh, useful for someone also to know that the space Chris has have a docker. So if you are a fan of docker, you will found uh, a docker image for the space Chris on our uh, GitHub repository. It is essentially maintained um, by people in, in, at the University of Bamberg in Germany. They uh, kindly uh, donate uh, the project to, to us to facilitate the adoption of this space Chris. So you can just clone the Docker repository and uh, use it. You can also customize the, the version file where you specify which version or branch do you want to compile. We have also um, set up the automatic uh, uh, build of uh, target version on um, the Docker app. So if you want, this is another option. Okay, so the process is finished now and uh, we need to execute the installer. So we go in this space, target this space installer and we need to run and update. So looking to the documentation, now we are in this step. Okay, it is testing the database connection. You will see a lot of warning from uh, Hibernate. What use of deprecated stuff, uh, thing like that. Okay, so now we can go to check the situation of the database. So in the install folder, we will execute uh, the space database info.
Okay, so here you see uh, what I expect. So we have some script that was in the state uh, me, um, less than the baseline. That is the new way that uh, Flyway called the pre-init state. And some of these uh, SQL are related to the space Chris. In our case, it was the 1.8 and the 3.2, because we have started from a 4.0. And you will see that other the space Chris uh, script are just ignored because was uh, skipped when we migrate from the space four to the space five. Because of course, the space don't have the, the SQL script of the space Chris. So to solve that, uh, as not in documentation, we need to execute manually some, uh, some script some SQL script. This is uh, an example. And here you see that you must run manually the SQL script that are relevant for you. So going back uh, before to, to miss uh, a detail, you also need to create manually some additional folder for the space Chris. So we are we going to install folder. And we create uh, this directory. Uh, these directory are where the um, file of Chris entity are stored. So in this folder, all the file directly attached to the researcher page will go. Uh, of, of project, organization unit, and uh, uh, dynamic entities. This other for, uh, folder is used by the um, SOAP web service to generate the, um, the XSD uh, dynamically when you change uh, the data model. So you also need to copy uh, the content from uh, the source code for the uh, initial West, uh, XSD. So we take from here web services and we need to copy in this new folder, including some folder. Okay, so now we can deal with the uh, database. So we need to run the script for the space Chris uh, 1.8. That essentially mean uh, we need to connect locally to the space five and execute the uh, uh, SQL that we have in the source folder. And it is the 1.a.u.0 in the space Chris. And the same for the other SQL script that was uh, uh, skipped. So 1.8.u.1. Uh, I put the wrong name, so it is, okay. And the last one related to 1.8.u.2. And we also have one related to version three. Okay, so now we have fixed the situation of the pre-init. So we have restored this script and this one. We need to solve now the issue about uh, ignored. Um, the SQL script. To do that, we can uh, execute a database repair. So, this place database repair, and after that, we can run to migrate in your head. One note here while you're doing this, Andrea, um, you might consider. Uh, automating the manual process here 
uh, you could probably do that using um, a flyway using some Java code. Uh, you could potentially create a Java migration that actually will run these, these uh, in this case, four migrations that you had to do manually uh, just by checking to see what, what is in the database, the current database state, and then manually kicking off these or automating it via Java. <laughs> yeah, this is something that we want to explore, but it's not easy. Okay. Because essentially, Flyway expects to have a linear history of your uh, of your project because you immigrate from one version to another. Right. In the case of this space, Chris, we have uh, uh, an interconnected history between this space and this space, Chris. So um, you are in uh, a stale uh, state in some case, and this is exactly the situation. So in Flyway, see, you are at the point of version five, but it, it is not true because you have skipped some information. Right, yeah, I understand that. I'm just noting that you might be able to automate this via Java code, where the Java code can say, um, are there DSpace Chris SQL scripts that are noted as the pre-init or whatever that state is? If yes, let's run them in order. Um, in Java code, not by Flyway, or that that would get triggered by Flyway. Oh. The Java code would get triggered by Flyway, but you wouldn't use Flyway to run these directly, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, hard to explain, but but I think you might be able to still achieve this via Flyway. You would just have to have Java in between it to do the um, processing of which scripts to run. Yeah, of course, this is typically one of the trick part of our migration or real migration. Yep. So we try yeah, I, to document, but uh, typical users often this time must keep this information and uh, yeah. So it could be useful to make it automatic. Yep. And now we can then just run the database migrated in your it. All these steps uh, don't apply when you migrate from uh, uh, a version below then the space 1.8, or if you migrate uh, from uh, a space uh, version that uh, was never migrated to a new version. So if you have version five and you have never migrated to a new version, you can migrate to the space Chris without run all this manual stuff. This is why we here have three different uh, situations. Okay, anyway, now we have a solved uh, issue of the database. And if we run again uh, um, the database info, you will see that uh, we are now migrated to version six. Yes, we have all the uh, SQL executed up to the space uh, Chris 6. Okay, go back to the installation procedure. We have our most finish. We need to load some additional uh, um, metadata in, uh, in the registry. Uh, related to the um, viewer framework uh, of the space Chris. So I will just run that. With the space Chris, you can uh, um, build uh, your own viewer for BStream so that instead you just download the, the BStream, you can decide to have uh, a streaming for video or to link uh, an image with an image server. So to use AAAF or things like that. And uh, out of box, you can download uh, the CKN add-on that allow you to mm, visualize a CSV file and Excel file using uh, um, 
that you can um, uh, open web services and, uh, and viewer so that you can um, paginate your CSVO and uh, you can search in your CSVO without full download of the information. Just as a note on that too, Andre, I think this could also be simplified for the future. Um, Flyway has this concept of callbacks um, and we actually already have a registry updater for callback that, that checks to see the DSpace registries have all been run. Uh, you could potentially do a similar um, DSpace Chris registry callback, which would automatically um, initialize these registries for you. Uh, yeah. And, I, and you might be able to use that same callback concept for the I, for this uh, the earlier SQL um, fixing the SQL before running other uh, flyaway scripts. So those are just side notes. I'm just letting you know that I think you could this could be simplified um, in several ways. Nice, yes, thank you. So uh, we have completed the uh, special task of the upgrade. So the documentation say you need to go back to the normal installation procedure and to deploy uh, task. So we need to get okay. So now we need to load the uh, this space Chris data model. As we will see today, you can uh, configure the data model of this space Chris using Excel file or using the user interface, but you need to provide a starting point uh, during the installation process. And we provide the Excel file with a basic configuration for uh, um, Chris-like system. Uh, just a note, this space Chris is not only about Chris system, I said more several times, this space Chris is a, a flexible platform that allows you to add additional entities in this space and link uh, this entity with uh, this space items or uh, between them. So you can create your completely data model that would be completely different than a Chris system. It could be a system for cultural heritage, it could be uh, everything. By default, we provide a configuration that is a good start for Chris system. Does, does this space Chris work without this uh, step? Uh, if you don't execute this step, it, it, it will work or? It will be a base this space. Essentially okay. you. Uh, if you don't run, uh, uh, this space Chris should work if you don't uh, run this step or you don't execute this step? Uh, at the end, this, uh, now the space Chris will execute this step automatically. If ah, okay, okay. Run. So if you don't want to load the data model, you need to clean up the, uh, the Excel file. Because uh, if you start Tomcat, uh, similar to what Tim say about uh, the callback script for initialization, it will look to the Excel file in your installation folder and will try to update your configuration. Sorry. Okay. So we need to uh, load the configuration now. This is a, a, another tricky point of the space Chris. Uh, typically you need to run uh, this script two times. Uh, this is because when uh, uh, the first time is used to create the entities, uh, if you have custom entities, uh, in the first round, these custom entities will be created. The second round will create the attribute in your custom entities. So this probably can be, uh, this can be improved for sure, but it was not urgent and not something that we have decided to, to invest now. 
So when the, the scripted it, uh, uh, this situation, that in this specific case was uh, uh, you have a custom entity for journals and a custom entity for events, uh, the script say you need to relaunch again the script. Andrea, you are executing uh, this uh, uh, second uh, time? Second? Yes. It is required to, to run it twice? Yes. Okay. If you have custom entities, you need to run two eyes. Okay. Uh, custom, I mean, for custom entity, I mean something other than researcher profile, organization unit, and project. I, I was asking, I was asking you that because I only run it once in the, in the the virtual image that I shared, um, but I I think I achieved the same result as you did in this demonstration. Uh, probably yes, because when you start the Tomcat, the, it will automatically run the script for the second time. Okay. Thank you. But I, I prefer to run it uh, manually instead and wait for more time to Tomcat to start. Also because if you make additional change to the configuration file and you want to load uh, from the command line, often you need to run two times. This is uh, one of the exercises that we have uh, today. Okay, so... May I, may I ask some, some other question, please? Yeah. So I was running a fresh install of DSpace Chris on DSpace Vagrant, and it all ended up in the Tomcat um, using all of the memory it could get and all of the CPU it can get, and in a Tomcat Java heap space. But I don't see any error in the logs that really helps me to understand what's going on. Basically, the JSPUI is not able to be deployed in Tomcat. Do you have any idea what? I could have missed a step for the Tomcat to be done before deploying the JSPUI. Uh, I see an issue like that when uh, you have circular um, reference in the configuration. Yeah. So something missing on the build properties on the local CFG file. I, I had the same issue. I, I managed to 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 find the solution. It was the 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 user, the owner for some folders that should be okay. uh, Tomcat user instead of the, the space user. Okay, thank you. And in the, on the installation page, I found some, some information about some Tomcat parameter skip identifier checks that has to be set. Um, can you give us some background what it's doing and why this is necessary? Yes, this is what we need to do now. So essentially we have built the system and now we need to uh, deploy on Tomcat. So to deploy on Tomcat, we need to, oh, sorry, I will search. Oh, why I don't found it? <laughs> okay. Oh, there is the, the, okay, here. This is the knot that uh, uh, Pascal talked about. So we need that because uh, unfortunately in the JSP file in some tag library, we have used uh, um, the word class as an attribute. It was possible before then Tomcat 6. So you can uh, have your uh, uh, Java bean that have an attribute that is named uh, a method that is get class. And you can use in the JSP uh, the expression language saying uh, bean dot class. But starting from Tomcat 7, this was become a reserved word. 
So it was uh, not anymore uh, possible. And to restore the previous behavior, you need to add this, uh, uh, this parameter. This is why it is uh, needed. Essentially, we can remove that, but we need to just clean up uh, uh, some, uh, um, some GSP and tag library, and we never find the time to do that. Is this a bug in DSpace, Andrea, or is this in Chris, DSpace Chris? Uh, it's only in uh, DSpace Chris, because DSpace okay. don't use, unfortunately, DSpace don't use expression language. So oh, oh, the JSP okay. file in this space typically are scriptlet, but in this space, Chris, we have used the, uh, the expression language too, Ivory, to work possible to simplify the, the JSP file, but with uh, uh, this issue. So it's essentially a workaround for a known bug in DSpace, Chris? Yeah, it is not really a, a bug. It's just a change of the uh, parser of this right. uh, Tomcat. Okay. And they provide a way to be in, in the old way. So it is not mandatory by any standard or anything else. Of course, it would be a good idea to don't use attributes that uh, are close to be preserved work. But this was something that uh, 10 years ago we was not aware of, and that's why now we have that. Okay, so um, to set that, I have prepared uh, a set of uh, uh, script on the server we can show. So essentially it's just the set of Catalina Ops where I set to one gigabyte of minimal memory, two gigabyte half as maximum. Uh, for the encoding it to UTF-8 as required also by the space. And we set uh, the uh, skip identifier check to true. The setemv uh, script is automatically executed uh, by the Catalina, uh, the Catalina script. So if I do all my work properly, we should be able to start. So I put the set end in the wrong directory because we need to put in, uh, uh, in the bin folder of Tomcat. And now we can uh, start Tomcat. We want to monitor. Okay. I haven't uh, uh, deployed again to the WAR file because I have a symbolic link from the Tomcat web apps folder to the a web apps folder of um, the installation directory. As you see that the uh, uh, data model is loaded again, but all the information is skipped because it was already loaded. Okay, the server should be started. So we can refresh here. Uh, we have an internal error, we need to check. Okay, it was just the uh, indexing process. So that was still in progress. Here you see that the uh, uh, five thread was started to index the content of, of the space. This is because the space crisp um, provide uh, multi-trading support for the indexing. This is something nice that we could uh, uh, also import to the basic the space, I think. So if anyone ha have time, want to, to help, this could be one thing that can easily port to the space. 
it improve a lot uh, the performance when you have large uh, repository to to index. Nice, yeah, I like that idea. I refresh because I have some okay some CSS in the cache. Okay, so this is now how our display space installation essentially and we have uh, all the information from uh, the demo server of of um, of the space okay uh, we can check what is wrong with uh, with the item but uh, maybe we can just move to the next exercise otherwise i think that we will have no time to to check the configuration of this space, Chris. So the exercise was to uh, manipulate the, config, the data model configuration to add additional uh, uh, information to the researcher profile. I will uh, log in into the system. This is the credential from the public demo. In the MyD space, the space Chris provides the ability to create a researcher profile for the logged in user. So I'm going to create my profile. Uh, by default, it is flagged as private. Uh, I can move to my profile. And I can edit the profile. And I will make it public and I will put some information here, such as uh, a Scopus author ID and the researcher ID that was the initial proposal for, for the field is already present in the default data model. This is why I proposed to add uh, a Google Scholar attribute. So by default, you have ORCID, Scopus author ID, researcher ID and uh, all the parts related to the um, multiple name for uh, a researcher so that you have the full name, the preferred name for the researcher, some vernacular name that are important for Arabic people or Chinese people, and additional variants that could include the name of Marriott or uh, the second family name and things like that. Uh, we will save and now we have the scope of ID and the research ID here but we need to uh, to give a room for uh, uh, the Google Scholar link so to do that we log in into the administrative part of the system I will open a new uh, window so it will be easier to check what happened in the Chris module section you have uh, uh, access to um, your entities. We need to manipulate the configuration of the researcher page. And on the public view, we start, we see that we have four tabs defined, that are this one. And we want to add information in the first tab. So the first tab is composed by uh, three uh, box. You see here the profile box. You don't see the other two box because are empty. So they are not shown because uh, currently we don't have any project or any publication associated with this uh, researcher. And in the profile box, we want to add a new information. We want to add the uh, Google Scholar. So we create a new property field definition. We need a text field. And uh, we will put uh, Google Scholar as short name. The short name of the field is uh, pretty important because it is used uh, in the export and the import functionality. It is the unique uh, ID of the, the information of the field. It is similar to the metadata uh, 
field key in a normal space. Uh, we put a label for that and we decide who will be able to uh, manipulate this information. We want to have uh, uh, both research and then the administrator able to edit. It could be mandatory or not, it could be multiple value or not. And you can set some uh, preference about the visualization, where to put this information in, uh, in, the, uh, in the record, if you want to have uh, uh, at the start of the record page or at the end, and uh, how much room you want to give to the edit uh, input. Maybe you want to give more space. And we can save now. So if we go back to our uh, researcher, and now we go to edit, you will see that there is an additional information that is the Google Scholar profile. And here we can put uh, my Google Scholar profile and save. And you will see that this information is present now in the profile box. Of course, this is not the ideal way to render a link because it just text, you cannot click on that. So we can go back and edit again the configuration of this new field. So Google Scholar profile, we go to edit. And we can use the uh, custom rendering uh, parameter to decide that the value that we have uh, introduced will be uh, decorated in some way. Uh, we can access to the value using uh, the um, graph zero graph uh, as placeholder. So if we put uh, some HTML here with uh, a link that used the value and a fixed text, uh, such as C profile and we save. Now the public page, if I refresh, we show a C profile and I can click here and go to uh, my Google Scholar. You can do also more complex things like show badge with uh, some Java, additional JavaScript and, and some using the, uh, the custom rendering you can do something much more sophisticated using uh, uh, external rendering. The external rendering concept is uh, uh, the ability to put uh, a fragment, a GSP fragment in a specific folder of the web apps that will be used to replace the rendering of a wall tab or uh, a box or also a single uh, field in this space case. So if you need to have something that is uh, very customized uh, for you like that, where we don't have uh, uh, the information immediately uh, displayed in the tab, but we want to have some more control about uh, the box rendering, you can use a, um, a custom GSP. Here you only need to put the code related to the uh, a rendering of this specific box. And you can do that also for a very single field if you require to do something very complex. But, but you can also uh, uh, inject uh, JavaScript in that field? Isn't yes. That, isn't that uh, unsafe? No, you, because you, this you, is the... Uh, you do that in the configuration of the data model, in the definition of the data model, and the uh, data model configuration can be changed only by the administrator. So you cannot inject a uh, script uh, as value of, uh, uh, of the attribute. So you can decide to do that, of course, uh, if you customize your uh, box rendering. But typically, you, are, you don't allow researcher to put JavaScript or HTML text in the, in the input that they made. But you allow the administrator to customize a bit using HTML uh, in the configuration. OK, thank you. So this is similar we had, to- we had, 
Yes, please. Sorry. Go some weeks ago, we had some issue on demo DSpace org that somebody put some JavaScript in a collection or community title, and also there the reaction of us was quite clear. Um, Andrea Bolini handled it and just said, you know, we trust um, administrators of DSpace. Of course, administrators of DSpace are able to inject some JavaScript at different points, but but as long as only administrators are able to do this, we just have to trust them, you know. Yeah, you can have some specific project where uh, you cannot trust your administrator. For instance, if you have a multi-institutional repository or something very, very, very open. But I think that these are uh, uh, requirements of, uh, are very specific requirements. So if you are hit a situation like that, you can ma uh, manage with a very small customization. This is both for this space, Chris, than this space. I think you should never hit such a situation because administrators are allowed to do everything in this space all the time. So actually in the, if we check resource policies, we always check is it an administrator and if it is, we always say yes to everything and don't even check further policies. So the administrators is really something that we in this space are trusting on. And I think that's a concept we lived quite good within in the last years. And I think it's a concept which is quite natural. So if you have an administrator who is able to delete items, of course, you have to trust them for example. But I think that's another discussion, just, just an idea about it. Yep, and that's, that's completely accurate. So admin users are, are fully trusted. So we, we allow them to do literally anything. So I see no reason why they couldn't um, inject JavaScript themselves if they want it there, but, but we do not allow normal level users to inject JavaScript, which is as Andrea pointed out and as Pascal also just pointed out. Okay. So if you have an additional question on that, uh, I will show you a similar task uh, done using the Excel file. So to, the next task is to add uh, personal blogs uh, information that uh, should be a multiple entry field uh, for the user to store URLs. And we want to do that using the Excel file. I've shared in the Google Doc um, a Google Drive folder where you will uh, find uh, the Excel file that I'm going to import now. Uh, I will open so that you can see. Essentially, this is the Excel file that you get uh, out of box with this space, uh, with this space, Chris. This is the demo configuration. I have uh, highlighted in the file just the row that I created to manage the new blogs information. So um, you need to say that uh, this new field uh, belongs to our researcher profile, so an RP. Uh, blogs is the short name, but you want to have blogs uh, uppercase as a label. It is repeatable. You want to have that uh, in a very uh, low position, and it is allowed to be edited by um, both researcher than the administrator. And uh, oh, I can check the column header. It is not mandatory and uh, it is of type uh, uh, link. Uh, link is uh, a special kind of text that essentially have two parts. One is used as display and one is the real link. Uh, okay, this is... Mm, mm, no, because it's not a pointer. So this column is to, to say if it is a, a attribute link to other uh, entity in your data model. So the additional column depend on the kind of uh, input that you select. So if you select a pointer, you need to use this column to say which is the target entity and how you um, you can construct the URL to access the detail page for this entity and so on. 
If it is a text, you can use this column for uh, the custom rendering and things like that. The additional columns are all related to the sites that you want to give to this information in the public view. So if you check uh, into either, you see the label sites, uh, the, the wide of the field, and things like that. So here we define the, uh, the new property, the new field blocks. And we need to say that these blocks uh, is in, included uh, in a specific tab. So we have a, a box to metadata where I say that uh, uh, blocks field is included in the researcher profile uh, box. And also I say that uh, I create, uh, uh, I put the Google Scholar ORCID authority Scopus ID in uh, um, a box that is named identifier. You will see in the box tab that this is a, a new box that I'm just creating using the Excel file. So we can import such file. So I, Andrea, while you're doing that, is this Excel spreadsheet, um, I, I'm assuming this isn't kept in sync with what you're currently displaying. It's just a way of modifying the display of DSpace, Chris? You, you can export your current configuration uh, in the Excel file. Oh, okay. So from the command line, you can uh, just create your current Excel file. This is quite convenient also for when you need to ask for help. Because as the configuration could be very different, you can have a completely different data model. If you need to ask for help, it will be useful to, to share your data model if you have some customization. So this is a way to, to have a dump of your data model in the Excel file. Uh, the other thing is then uh, um, the Excel file will not replace your data model but will only integrate your data model. So if I remove all the line in the Excel file and just uh, keep the, the new uh, information, it will work exactly in the same way. So when you import the Excel file, you never delete any definition or attribute or anything else. You, you cannot change what already exists. You can only add new entity, new relation, new attribute. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so It is a short break. I may give some more information about the problems I was running into. So I installed DSpace Chris on Vagrant. And DSpace Vagrant by default um, deploys all web apps. And if I'm deploying all web apps, the uh, Tomcat uses too much memory. So if I only deploy Zola and JSP UI, then everything is fine. So if you want to run DSpace Chris on DSpace Vagrant, you should change the way DSpace Vagrant deploys web apps. Good to know, Pascal. The other option there just to note is you can actually up, um, up the memory that your Vagrant has. So you could increase it to, I think the default is two or three gigs and you could potentially run your Vagrant with like five gigs or so if you have that available. Yeah, I'm not sure if it helps or if some web apps are blocking um, each other. I'm not sure. You have to okay. test it. Yep. But just deploying Zola and JSP UI, even Zola, JSP UI, and, and XML UI works good together. Everything else, the SWAT app, the OAE, and so on, you have to test it for your own. Sounds okay. good. We are sure that you can run uh, uh, the OAE PMH server and the SWORD application because these are typically used by our production site. Uh, yeah, but you need to play a bit with the memory and, and to see how much memory you need to give to, to load of the application in the same 
uh, in the same Tomcat. Also, a, a general recommendation that I, uh, I give typically is to run Solar on a different Tomcat. This is the usual way that uh, uh, we run it. You need to play a bit more on the file system and uh, to be able to connect maybe with uh, a completely different uh, server and to customize some uh, uh, configuration parameter but uh, it will uh, improve a lot of performance if you have a separate Tomcat for so. Okay, I'm checking uh, my notes because Okay, so we need to load configuration, but it's not this file. It is the file for blobs identifier, so the one that I show you. This warning that you see comes from the uh, library that parsed the uh, Excel file that worry about uh, um, the Italian version of Excel that was used to create Excel uh, file uh, and uh, 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 some formatting that uh, will be ignored that I put in the Excel file. But there is no issue. As you see, the script don't tell you to, uh, to run it again because we are not created new entity. We have just added uh, box tabs and, uh, uh, and an attribute. So if I go back on the research page now and go to edit, I will find uh, uh, the blobs somewhere. Here, I put uh, in the top. So I can say uh, company and put uh, one link. It is repeatable, so I can put another one that is this space Chris and the link. As you see, you have a, um, a checkbox here. That means uh, um, allow the researcher to decide if this information is public or not. So you can have uh, multiple email address or multiple uh, blogs, as in this case, recorded in your record. But you can decide to only show the second one or the first or both, things like that. This was also the case for the email address. It is present in the record, but is not public show. If I save now, you have uh, the blog's information here with the company linked and to the space crease linked to the record the space crease. So this is similar to the setup of, uh, um, of uh, our Google Scholar but uh, um, the difference is then we have created uh, uh, the link in Google Scholar using uh, uh, the custom rendering. That means that uh, the name that is shown in the Google Scholar profile, C profile, is defined by the administrator and will be the same for all the researcher. Using the link type instead, uh, each researcher will be able to create a new site, say this is my company website or my open source project, and uh, we'll create the link under uh, the title. And also you see that we now have indicators, the researcher indi identifiers uh, box that was created by the Excel file, where uh, the Scopus ID and uh, researcher ID and the Google Scholar profile was included. So the Excel file give you but the same power than the user interface to manipulate your, uh, your data model. Do you have any question about that?
I think I will have to try it out myself later. And maybe I come back with questions towards you after time. Okay, you're welcome. So I have added uh, an exercise that is uh, still using the front end interface. I want to define a completely new entity uh, that is the funding program. And we want to link this funding program to an organization, so the funder. And we want to be able to link a project to a funding program. So to do that, we go on to administrative user interface. So, uh, in the Chris module, we need to manage other Chris entities. We have journals and events that come from the default configuration, but now we want to add a completely new entity. So we give a short name to this entity and uh, of course a label. And now I can click on fund to go to administ administrate uh, uh, the fund entity. And uh, we need to create tabs for that. So I will create uh, uh, detail tabs just to put the content inside. We want to have this tab public. We need also an edit tab for uh, this entity. Instead to create a separate edit tab, I use this shortcut from the public tab to say that I want an edit tab that is exactly the same as the public tab. Uh, so um, it was created, it's named by default as edit uh, details. So it's prefixed with edit and I can save. The value of this edit tab is that any change that I made to the public tab will be also reflected to the edit tab. So in this space, Chris, you can configure the public view and the edit view independently. This could be convenient in some case because you want to have uh, the public view separated in uh, different tabs in different sections but maybe you want to have the edit view as a long page where all the information is displayed, you can do that. But if you just are fine to have exactly the same public view used also for the edit view, you can use this shortcut to, uh, to make your uh, configuration uh, consistent and, and ways to align it. So going back to uh, the menu, I need to create the box. I call also the box detail because it will be the main uh, data of my funding program. It will be public. Uh, I want to include some field. Uh, I need to save. So now I can include the field. Uh, the funding name is created automatically when I create a new entity. Uh, automatically a name attribute is created for this entity. This is the only required information for any entity. We want to have this uh, name included in our box. So I save. And I want to create uh, uh, additional attribute. One is uh, the link to the founder. So we want to create, uh, uh, we are creating an entity to represent a funding program. It could be, for instance, the FP7 or the H2020 in Europe. And for in both case, the, the funder will be the European Commission. So what we need is uh, uh, an attribute that contains a reference to an organization unit. So we create this new poverty. The short name will be funder and uh, the label will be funder with F uppercase, it will be editable. We don't need to set any special attribute for display, but we need to decide how to display um, the funder when we are uh, editing the information. So uh, we want to have uh, in the autocomplete box the name of the funder. So here we need to put some expression language, say that we are displaying an object, we want the name attribute of the object that we are visualizing. 
you can eventually set um, some filter query to restrict uh, the list of organization units that can be attached to a funding program. And you need to set uh, uh, how the URL will be created to link to access the, uh, the, fund, the funder page. We save this information. So with those sort of advanced options, it seems like you'd really need to know how things are stored in solar and such. Are there guides, I guess, to help people out with that? Or is that just something that's much more advanced? You just have yeah, to understand it. Depend it. On, uh, you can use the, the attribute that you have defined. So I will show you a more articulated example when I link the project with the funder. Okay. with the funding program so that you can understand but uh, essentially every attribute that you have uh, configured in the system can be used in the auto complete in the search and so on and you use the short name that you have defined to access this information but these are all information that you should have you just need to to learn a bit of expression language uh, syntax Okay, the box is saved, so we need to check that uh, the box is included in the tab of the funding program. So in the layout, application to the details tab, now we need to have the main data box. I think that the, this should be how to play with these entities. So, we got to create a couple of entity to make test. We got to organization unit and create a new organization unit. We want them as public. Uh, we set uh, the name as uh, European Commission. We need to set a director because the organization unit is typically used as department and faculty uh, in this space, Chris. So to the full configuration, or make mandatory the directory field, but you can change that, of course. You can remove the, the mandatory flag, uh, but we can just associate the uh, European Commission to our administrator and say that it's in Bruxelles and uh, uh, it's in Belgium. And we can save this information. Okay. Maybe we can also add uh, the logo of the European Commission, just to be a bit more nice. In this case, the logo will be stored on the file system in the folder that we have uh, created today. So that, um, all files folder in the installation directory. And now you have the record for uh, uh, the European Commission. Going to the administrative area, you can create also a funding program. So we go to the funding and we add a new uh, fund here. So the funder is the European Commission. And uh, uh, this is the name that is created by default without label, but you can add, add that uh, editing to the configuration. And we call it uh, Horizon 2020. We can make it public and save. So now we have our uh, funding program that is linked to the European Commission. So we can move from one to the other. And we want to extend the uh, default uh, data model of the space Chris to allow the project to refer to the funding program. So again, in the uh, Chris module administration section in the project, we will go to create a new attribute in the project to refer to the funding program. So we have uh, an information stub for project where there are some primary data also here. And in the primary data, we want to create the new information that is the link to the um, funding program. So we create a new uh, property field 
And uh, uh, this is similar to what we have done to link the funding program to the organization, but is a bit more advanced because we are linking an exist, uh, um, known entity that is the project with something that was just created by us is a custom entity, the funding program. So we need to add a generic research entity reference uh, field. Also in this case, we give uh, um, a short name. This can be everything, is just uh, uh, the short name used for import, export, and so on. For in internationalization, where apply and, and things like that. And we put also uh, a label, make it editable. And here we need to decide what happened when we uh, search to link a funding program to, um, to a project. So for instance, we can start uh, in a very easy way saying that we want to have uh, just a, a funding program name. We know that we are linking not to a journal, but a funding program. So we pick our entity here and we go with the default way to, to link the, um, the detail page for the record. And I save this information. I will go back and keep open uh, our configuration to show you how this uh, thing change when we manipulate this data. Uh, going to another Windows, I will create a project now. So if you go to the project section and add a new project, make it public, and I call it my project, and give some information. You here have the funding program. So the new attribute that we have created, and I can search for uh, horizon, uh, how we name it. I make some error in the configuration for sure. I need to check here. Okay, it looks good. I see your example yeah, syntax says full name. Does it need to be full name versus name or does that matter? Full name is uh, just the exception for the researcher page that has full name. All the other entity have a uh, name. Ah. I think that uh, the funding program is not indexed. So this could be the issue. I, we can check. if we have it or not. Hmm. We have the European Commission. Yeah, the funding is here. So why it doesn't work? Okay. Sorry for that, it doesn't work. So we can try to, to change that just to say. Okay, so funding. Okay, this is our configuration for the funder. We need to check the configuration for the project. Into primary data, we have the funding program. 
Okay. Okay, we change that. Okay, I will make a last attempt to re-index to our funding program. Maybe we have some issue during the indexing. We can add it. Typically, we need to, to wait uh, up to five minutes for new data to be indexed in solar. This is the default configuration of the space Chris with the auto commit on, uh, on solar. Okay, maybe we can make another test uh, later. But uh, what should happen here, I don't know really why it don't work now, is that you are able to search in the funding program uh, directory. And uh, the autocomplete will be created using the expression language that you have configured. So in, in our case, I put this, This expression language that essentially mean uh, you need to visualize the funding program, and uh, uh, between uh, square brackets you can visualize the name of the funder. So what you should expect searching for Horizon, you should see Horizon 2020, and between brackets you will see European Commission. This is the expected output of, of that. Okay. Do you have a question on that? Um, I don't have any questions. I mean, it seems pretty powerful. Um, it also does seem like it's it would require a good amount of training to understand the expression language, but I'm assuming there's plenty of examples there. I saw a couple there in the the UI itself, but hopefully you have other examples of useful ways to configure that? Yes, it will become more clear if you look to the uh, Java code. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you have a uh, display object is the name of uh, uh, the Java bin that is associated with uh, uh, the, Chris, the target entity that you are looking. So this base object represent the funding program that uh, that you have. So that name means that you will get the name of your uh, Chris entity, and you have a space here. So uh, the dollar is used to to start the expression language. Everything that is outside uh, dollar and uh, graph is just written as is. So the score bracket and so on. And here you say display object dot anagraphica for view is uh, uh, the name to access all the property of the object as a map, where the key of this map is the short name of your property. So this means that you want to have the funder of, of your funding, pro, uh, funding program. And as every property could potentially be um, repeatable, uh, they are returned as array. So you want to have the first value. This is why you have brackets zero. Mm -hmm. And you want to have the, the string representation of your founder. So you want to have the name. But you can go more in depth and say uh, dot 
the par uh, director and go to have the name of the director of the funder that is linked to the program. This will be exactly the same code that you could put in a JSP file if you are uh, doing that uh, with JSP. Okay. So if you don't have other question, the next exercise will be uh, similar to this one, but using the Excel file. I wonder if we should pause here because I know we only have 20 minutes left. I don't know if there was anything else we wanted to to talk through or just, just talk over the overall demo so far because I think you've given us a lot to, to think about, Andrea, which I thank you for. I think it's been excellent to get a sense of how this all works and it shows that it's extremely powerful um, with what you can do both at the um, Excel spreadsheet level and at the user interface level. Um, so I just wonder if it's worth pausing here to see if there's any thoughts from anyone here regarding um, the powerfulness of this. Um, are, you like, are you impressed with what you're seeing? Is there questions or concerns or comments that you would have? I just want to make sure we have time for that before we jump into more exercises. I, I agree with you. Team, uh, I think it, it's uh, it is very powerful, and uh, the, the user, I think it, it can make anything. Uh, but um, I I think also that uh, it could be, or you should try to put it more simple. For me, I I was kind of lost when you were changing all that screens. Where where you were uh, or wh what what you were changing, uh, I'm, I was a bit lost. It, for you, it's it's easier because you as uh, you have the the experience, but uh, I, I was lost perhaps. Um, and I I think you already uh, talked about this. You you said that. Uh, uh, you, we, we shouldn't focus on this uh, current uh, uh, user interface because uh, the the next one will be uh, different. Uh, but but I I had that uh, feeling I, I was a little bit lost in this uh, changing or screens changing. Yeah. And I'll Sorry. Just to add to that, yeah, I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. I'll say that, yeah, I agree. Um, I think there's a lot of, because it is so powerful, there's a lot of screens, a lot of clicks to get to each thing, which is all fixable stuff because, yeah, we're working on a new user interface. There's lots of areas we can include, we can improve usability. Um, so we shouldn't necessarily concentrate on how many steps it takes to do things here or how it's laid out on this particular user interface. I, I, I agree. I complexity is, does mean that the user interface becomes quite complex naturally. So it's a matter of if, is there ways that we can streamline it going forward? I, I felt yeah. it, I, I, it was necessary some context in the, the, the screens we were, were mm -hmm. watching. Yep. Yeah, you need to take, take in mind um, that this screen is primarily for administrator and typically you don't touch them too much. So it is not a daily job to change to the model of, the, of your system. And if you do something very complex, typically you do that using the Excel file because it's much more convenient to to configure all the aspects. So you just use the user interface if you make some wrong uh, configuration using the Excel file, maybe you want to move uh, an attribute a bit more uh, upper or down in the page, or you need to change a label or thing like that. But typically you don't create a completely new data model using the user interface. This is also why we don't spend too much on this user interface because it is something very internal and typically only super administrator will use it. 
Yeah, that said, Andrea, I'm assuming there's probably a good amount of training that does have to go into this this area of DSpace, Chris, because of that complexity, just either understanding how to do things in either the Excel spreadsheet or how to step through the various layers in the administrative screens. Either one of these looks complex enough to me that uh, that you'd need to be trained on it pretty pretty well to, to understand it, especially if you're not touching it all the time. Or there'd have to be good documentation so you could step in and understand your data model, how it currently sits, and update it uh, based on how you want it updated. Um, that's not meant to be a criticism of DSpace, Chris. I'm just noting that, that that's kind of a natural natural aspect of a complex application and a complex uh, configurable data model is that you're going to end up with these complexities and managing that and you either need to solve those complexities through very clear documentation and training or you need to solve them by making the user interface much easier to to work with like almost like a, 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 a much more streamlined user experience but either one of those takes a good amount of effort and it's kind of where you want to put your effort yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Tim, on that. Uh, it is important for me to to show you the, the complexity and the power of this space, Chris, because there is a lot of work done. And uh, when you start to think about uh, a flexible data model, you can be wrong to think, okay, it can be just one year of work or six months or whatever, but there are so many things that you need to consider and you need to, to manage that is probably much more complex than uh, what you expect. Because at the end, this space crisis has grown over uh, more than eight years. So there is quite a lot of code and functionality. But if you want to have a flexible data model, you really need that. Because you don't know in advance about what you are talking about. So you need to create a new entity. You need to create a link between this entity. You need to, to be able to list uh, things related to an entity. So for instance, now we have created uh, the funding program. And the funding program is linked to the organization. But of course, we, it will be nice to have a list of funding programs associated with your organization when you list uh, see the, the organization page. So you also need to think about reciprocal link and, and things like that. It is quite a lot of stuff that you need to be, uh, manage. And if you look to the Excel file that you have in the Google uh, Drive, so maybe this other part could be also your own experiment. Uh, in the Google Drive that I linked uh, here, you have the other Excel file that uh, create a new entity to represent the repository. So the repository directory that was suggested by uh, um, FCCM. So here you see that we have uh, uh, additional property definition. This is what I uh, highlighted in orange. So we create a new entity that is named the repository. A repository have a description, a name, a picture, uh, is owned by an organization and a URL, uh, an OI uh, URL, a version, a software. And you create also the tabs and uh, all the box that are required for the repository and put your metadata inside a specific box. And for instance, one of these metadata is uh, a link to another entity. So also from the Excel file, you create a new entity the repository that is linked to an organization. And you say that this is a pointer to an organization unit and this is the way that the, um, how to complete the pointer work. So you do that using the Excel file. The other Excel file that you will uh, uh, found in the folder are, uh, let me show you here, are some Excel file to import information. So you can import organization, for instance. Uh, in this Excel file, you import minimal information. So the name and the logo about two organization. I created one for, for science, one for Google space. And the second Excel file import repositories. 
allow you to create to import information about the new defined repository entities and link this uh, repository entity to the organization. So you have three entry for entries for the repository, and uh, the first entries say that is linked to the uh, for science using only the identifier in an external database. So you don't need to know in advance which identifier will be assigned to the Forsyth organization or for the Dura Space organization. If you want to uh, fastly see what happened, uh, we can execute a port. So here we are importing the configuration for the repository. And after that, we can import the entities. So while you're doing that, I do want to make sure that others have a point to, um, to add feedback or questions or comments since we are getting to the end of the, the meeting here. Um, it's good that we, there's extra exercises that we can kind of walk through in our own time uh, after the meeting, but I do want to make sure that others have a chance to, to add in your comments or feedback. Since I feel like there's only been a few of us who've talked here, I've heard a lot of Paulo, Andrea, and Pascal a little bit, and myself, but I'm not sure if anybody else has anything else you'd like to add along the way. Yes, I, I can add some uh, additional comments or um, uh, reach the same conclusions. Uh, you, you already talk that the, the the question of the the possibility to have a lot of different com configurations and the, the these big uh, capacities are also a problem when we 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 are dealing with the configuration because as you have many options um, you also needs then to stabilize your system and it's more difficult for the the user the administrator to do that um, so i i think uh, also in, in terms of the the way the information is presented in some ways is not um, uh, easy to understand but uh, with documentation and some testing we can reach this um, but I, I see as a, a practical aspect for uh, this space with Chris entities implemented something like this, but more simple to use uh, and more focus on, on specific aspects and not be able to create um, many more entities and many more attributes regarding all these uh, entities so it's more powerful but also more complex and uh, we didn't um, uh, talk about another issue that it's not uh, the, the importance here in this uh, specific meeting is regarding the way we will then expose and share all this information regarding for example the api the, the interface uh, YPMH in a specific metadata format, for example, to be able to to align with some uh, guidelines and metadata standards to expose exchanged information. Um, anyway, this is rich enough to be able to construct um, complex uh, schemas and to have a lot of information. But at the same time, it's quite difficult to to understand. And for example, uh, in in our case, we have done all these uh, steps already, and um, uh, we can understand and we can manage to understand all these steps. But if you want to give this to a, a, a local administrator, um, it, it will be more more difficult so um, i think this this is one of the, the the problem for us regarding the practical implementation of the the pilot we have done is is then to give this to to other people that don't have 
the same technical uh, skills and knowledge that we have um, and uh, and also the need we should have uh, to be able to help them in the future regarding not only the, the, the initial configuration of the system itself but another uh, issue we also find is to to curate the existing information to be able to connect the different entities and um, and information uh, on the system itself so that is my additional feedback regarding this yeah thanks for that jose um and i and i definitely see your point i didn't uh I, I think the power here is is a, is very impressive. The power, the flexibility is impressive, but but I, I'm sure I'm sure the four science team is well four science team is well aware that the, the user interface could be streamlined in a lot of ways, and I think that's an area that as this moves forward into like the Angular user interface, I I myself can see a lot of ways that this could be simplified to make it easier to comprehend um, to to like layman administrator folks who may not understand the Java code behind the scenes or uh, or even DSpace itself. Um, just trying to streamline that user interface and management. Um, there's a lot of areas that could be improved. So I can definitely see that. Are there other comments here? I want to <clears throat> only stress uh, the point about uh, give this administration to everyone because this is a step forward than the current administration of this space of this space so an administrator in this a typical administrator in this space right now don't deal with the input form don't deal with the item submission or the discovery cf uh, xmr file someone will uh, change this configuration file but many don't change anything here so the system support creation of new browse index, but you still use only the four browse that are defined in, in the default configuration. In many cases, the point is you need to create your data, the data model that meet your national needs. So for instance, in Italy, we have done a configuration that was fine for most all Italian university and they stay with that configuration. They will don't change the data model or things like that. Also, if uh, um, the space administrator will start to modify the item submission or the input form, no many of them will write custom steps or more sophisticated functionality of the space. So this layer of complexity exists also in the space it's become much more evident in the space crease because you have more uh, functionality and also you have some user interface where this become evident. But these inter user interface are mostly for repositories, very skilled stuff. Right. They want to use it. But uh, my own opinion is I don't want to invest on the user interface to modify it to data model because this is something that is really unfrequent. So I will be also happy to change onto the database in some way or in XML file. It's just convenient to have a user interface, but it's not important. I want to improve the user interface for the researcher, not for the technical people. Yeah, that's understandable, Andrea. And none of this was meant, I don't think any of this is meant to be criticism of how um, DSpace Chris currently functions. Um, and I agree with you completely that um, one of the aspects here of, of what we're seeing is that uh, rightly so, you brought some administrative tasks, some back-end sysadmin almost like tasks to the user interface. Um, and DSpace itself leaves a lot of those on the back-end, but in DSpace 7, we're gonna have to bring more of those towards the user interface and then future versions. So we're gonna encounter this in other areas of DSpace in general, that there are some tasks that are just complex and it's, we're gonna have to find ways to either streamline the user interface or uh, deal with it within documentation and training. Um, and this is just a, one of the biggest examples of that so far. 
Um, so, so it's no criticism necessarily of how you've done it. It's just noting that there is a lot of complexity here. Are there other comments here before? I know that we're at the top of the hour here. Um, I want to make sure others get their voice heard, though, if you have any other comments or questions. There's uh, a, a quick comment. I, I, I do agree with, with what Andrea just said, that this is an, an interface for super administrators. Mm -hmm. um, and that the usability of the UI is mostly important for the users and, and for the administrators, not per se the super administrators. But that being said, I do think that there is something to be said about the trade-off between um, how powerful it is and how complex it is to manage that power. And I think that is probably the, the key of the discussion. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to give a, an opinion at this point in the sense that I do want to look at this in a little bit more detail. Andrea, thank you for the, the, the very good overview um, and the follow for the virtual box. So this allows us as well to, to you know, play with this a little bit more and get more of a sense of, of how it also works behind the scenes when you do this configuration. And I think that is actually where we need to have the discussion. Uh, I, I agree with Andrea that uh, how it is presented in the user interface and the usability of that is not the key uh, point of, of this discussion. It's more about how flexible is the data model at current? How flexible do we want it in DSpace? And I even see the, the management of all of that as not per se something that everybody will work with and there might end up being a bunch of predefined configurations, as Andrea said, based on countries um, or on, on other uh, legal entities um, that, that work together and do things in the same way. Um, but it's more that, I mean, the, the discussion should focus more on how what this configuration actually creates in the back end, not so much how you do the configuration. And I think we do need probably a follow-up meeting to, to discuss that in more detail. Yep. Yeah, I agree with you completely, Levin. And I, and I agree with that direction that you pointed out as well, that it's, more, it's much more about where do we draw the line of the how complex should DSpace go down this realm? And is DSpace, Chris, too complex? Is it the right blend and we just need to um, uh, work on the deal with the fact that there's that super administrative layer that may be a little bit more complex that we just need documented or whatever um, but that that does require an additional meeting here an additional playing with it um, at our institutions because yeah, I mean I think there are a bunch of entities um, that maybe could be defined as kind of like standard that are there with a particular configuration where you can maybe extend the number of um, properties or attributes it has like entities mm -hmm. as author projects uh, quite common but whether or not an organization wants to have um, the funder as a separate entity and manage that as a separate entity or leave that as more of a, of a simple property within another entity mm -hmm. I think we can draw the line there and reduce the complexity by saying, okay, you know, this is what we'll include in like the fixed data model. And then you'll have some more configuration you can do on top of that. Um, I think that's how we can draw the line. And I mm -hmm. think that's probably where we need to discussion to go to see, okay, where do we draw that line? And then how, um, how do we build the flexibility? Is the current flexible data model a good way of extending it? Um, does it have shortcomings? Do we, have, do we want to change it in certain respects, but use it as a starting point and, and see where it can be improved? I don't know, Andrea, what do you think about that approach? Yeah, I like it. I think that you summarize quite well uh, what we need to do. So, um, what I'm trying to tell you, showing this place, Chris, is about uh, the functionality and the use case that this place, Chris, tried to address. So you are completely right about uh, we need to ship with uh, some reconfigured data model. This is our idea. Uh, now we have a simplified Chris data model. It 
for instance, is uh, not complex as serif. Because in, in our uh, default data model, we don't have the funding program entities. It is something that is present in serif out of box. Is because most of the universities just are fine to have an attribute, a string, in the project saying that is H2020 or F7 and something like that. We have another out of box data model that is for cultural heritage that we are named uh, GLAM. And I hope to have many of them. So we should have one very basic that only have researcher profile, not have anything else. Uh, another that is a researcher profile and project uh, oriented to European country where you need to deal with open air or things like that. So we should have many of them. So since we're over time here, I agree with that direction too. I think this all sounds great. Um, it, obviously, we're going to need a follow-up meeting to to start to look at that. Um, and can we get somebody to take that on as a task? Um, Paulo, are you willing to kind of schedule out a follow-up meeting and um, distribute, or do we have a note yes. taker here? Yes, I, I think. Um, because we are near to to next to this season holidays, I think the, probably the the next meeting should be on the next January. Yes, January. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah agree. I agree. Do you agree? Can you fix the date or can you? I, I can I can send a doodle. Uh, a doodle okay. 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 It sounds good for you. Yeah. 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 A doodle sounds perfect for me as well. Okay. I will send a doodle with a, a bunch of uh, data, dates for your to choose for you to choose. Sounds good. And yeah, the concentration on that meeting then would be what Levin had suggested there in terms of uh, looking more at uh, what's the simple data model that we want in DSpace and starting to analyze uh, DSpace Chris based on that. Is there a way to package up? Uh, does DSpace Chris model that in a way that we that we like and have that extendability to add extended data models onto there or is there something else that we need to look at or ways that we can tweak it um, to make that work and hopefully leave and if i misquoted you you can correct that in the in the notes or send something to apollo <laughs> <laughs> this this session is recorded so we can yep. all watch yeah. later true yep sounds good <laughs> okay Thank you. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you very all. much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Andrea. Bye bye. Thank you, Andrea, for, for your time. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, you this are. nice presentation.